good idea. I won't make you endure any more of that. So let me move straight on to my third example, which is um, uh, Blackpool. Um, in 1937, there's a, a social research organization that I'll keep mentioning today set up called Mass Observation. And Mass Observation was interested in trying to observe the conditions of mass life in, in, in Britain and to try and report, to provide more accurate knowledge of those conditions than they thought was available in the, um, in the uh, newspapers and in, in public discussion. And the way in which it did that was basically to do an ethnographic study of Britons um, going about their everyday life. And they set up one station in Bolton, um, uh, where they uh, took, uh, took up in Bolton, and they also did a study of Blackpool, where most Boltonians went on their um, uh, summer, uh, summer holidays. So much of the material that I'm going to be talking about now comes from this uh, study, which is how we know about um, a, a lot of the shows and the activities of people in, in Blackpool. Blackpool had 7 million visitors a year by 1939, and um, it had a fantastic combination of, of pleasure grounds, old sort of Victorian type of pleasure grounds, but with them integrated with the latest mechanised American modern rides, and a uniquely British flavour of freak show. Okay, so it had these three different components. And for many people, this absolutely symbolised the ways in which commercial um, mass culture pandered to the debased instincts of, um, of, of, of people. So let me give you two examples of these freak shows to see, um, uh, partly for entertainment and partly um, to give you a sense of the flavour of Blackpool at large. The first is the story of Colonel Barker, uh, or Colonel, to give you the full name, Colonel Leslie Ivor Victor Gauntlet Bly Barker, um, because who needs three initials when you can have five? Colonel Barker had an eating club for uh, veterans of the First World War and was involved on the fringes of fascist politics in London in the 1920s. But in 1929, that eating club um, went bankrupt and Colonel Barker was taken to Britain to prison where he was discovered to be a, a biological female. Um, indeed, a biological female born Lilius Irma Valerie Barker. Now, that wouldn't be so much of a problem, but the problem was, was that um, uh, uh, Lilius Barker had uh, married a man in 1918 and had mothered a child. The plot thickened still further in 1923 when um, Lilius had become... Leslie, and given herself the expert names of Gauntlet and Bly, um, and married a woman called Alfreda Howard. This was all basically discovered after this bankruptcy trial. So there was a, this was a huge scandal, and there was two elements about the scandal. First was how could this woman have pulled off this masquerade to be a man in, in the most you know, hyper-masculine world of fascist politics and, 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 and veteran uh, society? And even more titillatingly, how had Colonel Barker and his wife Alfreda Howard lived together as man and wife? Was that relationship ever consummated? Did Alfreda Howard know that she was living with a, uh, a man? Now, Colonel Barker had a very tenuous existence and went through three other names during the 1930s, but then in 1937, bankrupt, and uh, he agreed to, to go on, a, on display in Blackpool in a show built around him that reputedly attracted a million customers uh, during the summer season of 1937. And that show depicted Colonel Barker and his putatively newly wed, wed wife on their honeymoon. And they were in a pit. There was a glass ceiling that people would walk around, a sort of circular public um, gallery. There were two beds in the pit. And uh, in between them was a, a, a pedestrian walkway in Britain known as a zebra crossing and a large Belisha beacon, which is a, a traffic cone with a big throbbing light at the top of, the symbolism of which I hope I don't have to explain. And the whole point about the show was, was Colonel Barker going to consummate his marriage by the end of the, um, at summer, um, at the, end of the summer season? Another great freak show in, in Blackpool was the Anglican priest, um, at Harold Davison, who was the reverend, uh, the priest in a small Norfolk village known as Stiffkey, who had a penchant for rescuing fallen women, London's prostitutes, um, during the um, 1920s. The problem was, was that he, uh, someone took this photo of him um, in uh, 1932, and he was promptly defrocked by uh, the Anglican church. He continued to protest his innocence, and in 1935 went on hunger strike in Blackpool, um, uh, 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 in, this, in this box. He basically lived in this box during the day, um, uh, uh, dramatising his, um, his hunger strike. It was the same guy who put on the Colonel Barker show, put on the, uh, the Reverend Slipkey show. Um, unfortunately, Harold Davidson came to a rather sticky end. Uh, he he was on, uh, had another seaside show in a um, seaside resort known as Skegness on the East Coast in 1937, where he, um, the show was Daniel in the Lion's Den, basically. And he was Daniel, and unfortunately, you can see the lion here, but unfortunately the lion uh, took a rather unhealthy taste um, of Harold Davidson and mauled him to, to death. And all of the customers thought it was part of the show until they saw um, the buckets of blood uh, flowing out of the, um, out, of the, uh, out of the cage. So you'll see these types of mass culture were for many people the sign of quite how rotten and corrupt and debased commercial mass culture had become. And this spawned a big criticism of it that I'm going to talk to you about now. The first thing to say about this criticism of mass culture was that it, didn't, it wasn't attached to any particular politics. People across the right and the left were equally critical of mass culture for often similar reasons. In the first place, this critique of mass culture really came out of, of a crowd, the crowd psychology and, or social psychology that emerged, emerged after 1896 with Le Bon's work on the crowd. And then um, uh, you see it also in Hobson's critique of imperialism in 1901, the Italian political scientist Roberto Michel's um, in, uh, political parties. All of these books show that this fascination with the crowd and sort of mass psychology was not something that was unique to, uh, uh, to, to Britain. Nonetheless, as you can see by this little quote from William Ng in The Evening Standard in 1928, their view of, of, of the mass of mankind was really very derogatory. The idea was that democracy was going to be corrupted by a mass that could easily be led astray, that this mass lacked critical faculties. Probably one of the most famous um, examples of this was the work of very influential British literary critics, F.R. and Q.D. Leavis. It was a sort of husband and wife team based at the University of, um, uh, of Cambridge. 
and they gathered around them a critique of, of, mass, uh, of mass culture as having corrupted the forms of literature being produced in Britain. And in a way, their most famous manifesto was this pamphlet. It wasn't a pamphlet, it was a collection of essays called Mass Civilization and Minority Culture. So for the Leavises, what was required was an educated vanguard, a small minority who could protect civilization, okay, who, could protect, who would have the critical faculties to be able to protect aesthetic standards of judgment. You can see this, it's not just in the high realms of academic culture that this critique is evident. You can see that very clearly in Priestley's description of suburban, uh, of suburban England. You can also see it in the poem, poet uh, John Betjeman's um, uh, reading of Slough in 1937. Slough was one of the new suburban estates. It was actually very close to where my wife's um, grandparents um, bought their bungalow. In, and th I'm going to play you, first of all, this clip from uh, uh, the reading of Betjeman's poem. And then I'm going to read you Ricky Gervais's uh, counterpoint to it, because Slough is, of course, where um, the office was, was set. Slough by John Betjeman. Come, friendly bombs, and fall on Slough. It isn't fit for humans now. There isn't grass to graze a cow. Swarm over death. Come bombs and blow to smithereens, those air-conditioned bright canteens. Tin fruit, tin meat, tin milk, tin beans, tin mines, tin breath. Mess up the mess they call a town, a house, for ninety-seven down, and once a week for half a crown, for twenty years. And get that man with double chin, who'll always cheat and always win, who washes his repulsive skin, in women's tears. And smash his desk of polished oak, and smash his hands, so used to stroke, and stop his boring, dirty joke, and make him yell. But spare the bald young clerks who add the profits of the stinking can. It's not their fault that they are mad, they've tasted hell. It's not their fault they do not know the bird song from the radio. It's not their fault they often go to mainland and talk of sports and makes of cars in various bogus Tudor bars and daren't look up and see the stars, but belch instead. In labor, saving homes with care, their wives frizz out peroxide hair and dry it in synthetic air and paint their nails. Young friendly bombs and fall on slough. Get it ready for the plow. The cabbages are coming now. The earth exhales. So two key things I want you to pick up from, from that is that just as the Leavises have this uh, critique of the culture industry as having become uh, predicated around the concentration of ownership and the standardization of cultural forms, it's seen as trivial and escapist. And this is, in a way, the big thing that people like Betjeman and Priestley pick up on. And they gender it feminine, and it's associated with suburban, this new type of suburban culture. Um, and now, just for fun, and this has no relevance to the class whatsoever. Um, this is something that's always wound me up. Um, this is the poem Slough by Sir John Betjeman, probably never been here in his life. Right. Come friendly bombs and fall on Slough. It isn't fit for humans now. Right. I don't think you solve town planning problems by dropping bombs all over the place. So it's embarrassing stuff there. Next. Uh, there isn't grass to graze a cow. Good. We've got one of the biggest dairies in the southeast down the road, so I need a cow. Um, come bombs and blow to smithereens, those air-conditioned by canteens. Good. I'd love to see what I'm eating. Uh, tin fruit, tin meat, tin milk, tin beans, tin mines, tin bones. I only know tin fruit now, which I think, you know, if we'd been bombed, we'd be, we'd be in the air raid shower. No, it's tin fruit, so, you know, laughing him. Uh, it's not their fault. They do not know the bird song from the radio. It's not their fault. They often go to Maidenhead. There's nothing wrong with Maidenhead. No, Maidenhead's a shell, but Maidenhead's a lovely town, so, you know. And talk of sports and make of cars uh, in various bogus Tudor bars and then look up to see the stars, but Belch instead. You know, what? He's never burped. Um, uh, in labour-saving homes with care, their wives frizz out peroxide hair and dry in synthetic hair and paint their nails. They want to look nice. What's his problem? Do you like girls? You know. <laughs> the immortal Ricky Gervais. Um, Okay, so let's then turn to um, uh, look at the attempt to rebuild um, uh, uh, popular culture in more acceptable form. So after the critique of mass culture comes a very um, series of attempts to try and put it back together in more socially responsible and informed and educated ways. And of course, I'm going to begin this story with the good old BBC. Um, uh, I'm going to give you three examples, and I hesitate to do this with an expert in the room, but I'm going to talk to you about the BBC, and then I'm going to talk to you about the Left Book Club, um, and I'm going to talk to you about the Peckham Health Centre. And Oliver, I might well get you to have to talk about the Left Book Club. Oliver's just returned from doing his 101 research on the Left Book Club in, um, in, in Britain last week, so he knows more about this stuff than, than I do, for sure. Um, the BBC is the great, greatest example of this attempt to rebuild popular culture in more informed ways. Um, it's set up basically in 1922, um, but its founding text is always seen to be that of its first director general, John Reith's broadcast over Britain in 1924. Um, what Reith does is lay out the philosophy of public service broadcasting in Broadcast Over Britain. It's a mission that was developed in very deliberate contrast to the model of commercialized radio in the US. Okay? So whereas in the US and indeed across the continent there was a proliferation of commercial radio stations, in Britain there was no commercial radio station. There was a single state-sponsored radio um, uh, company known as the British Broadcasting uh, Company. And that state monopoly over broadcasting, which you would think could breed potential anxiety in a society that is thinking about the concentration of ownership of, 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 of public media, actually was pushed in the opposite direction. The BBC laid out its mission to try and educate the public. Its mission was to not follow public taste, because that way you would lead to Colonel Barker and, 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 and the Reverend Stifke, but instead try and elevate public taste, to improve it. Um, now, and, and, and Reith, John Reith ruled the BBC with um, a, 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 a firm hand. He insisted that everybody had to wear suits at work. Um, he, he hired almost exclusively uh, graduates of Oxford and Cambridge. It was very hard to hear anything but a cut glass British accent um, on the radio in the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, and he also put a huge amount of emphasis on talking programmes, news shows in particular, on drama, and um, on classical music, and on religious broadcasting. Okay? So the types of radio shows that were popular elsewhere, dance, dance shows, musical comedy, variety, the stuff that sort of comes out of musical, was very much sidelined in the output of the BBC. In fact, in 1933, there were only four weekly variety programmes. Um, and a lot, of that, uh, a lot of the popular dance music that was played didn't come on until after 10 o'clock at night when it was thought most respectable people had, had gone to bed. Now, the problem was, was that 
um, many people were pretty turned off by the uh, uh, broadcasting output of the BBC. And we know that because the BBC began to do listener research through its own organisations. It had two magazines, the Radio Times and the Listener. Um, and, uh, it, and, it, and it found out through them that many people basically wanted the more popular types of dance and comedy um, uh, and variety programmes. So by 1936, there are now 26, uh, 25 different um, weekly uh, variety um, uh, programmes. So slowly the BBC, it starts out with this very strict mission and slowly it begins to try and incorporate some of the more popular um, uh, types of, of, um, uh, of, of, of broadcasting. The other example that I wanted to give you today is of the um, Left Book Club. And I'll do my little spiel and if I've missed out anything, um, you must uh, get up and tell me how I've got this um, uh, wrong. Uh, the Left Book Club was set up by um, the publisher Victor Galland in 1936. And rather like documentary films that also began to develop in the 19, uh, early 1930s, um, uh, the idea behind the, uh, the Left Book Club was that it was going to establish a direct relationship with its readers. It was going to eschew commercial forms of distribution and that you would subscribe to the Left Book Club and they would send you directly their new uh, publications. And those publications were orientated around trying to educate the public about pressing um, social and political issues. And key amongst them was poverty and unemployment. So George Orwell's The Road to Wigan Pier was published through the Left Book Club. And also the spectre of fascism abroad. So Ernest Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms was also um, uh, uh, published um, under the Left Book Club. So it wasn't just that they were trying to educate people in terms of the books that they published. They also wanted to encourage their readers to be active readers, to, to, to think seriously and to critically discuss these books. And to that end, they formed um, over a thousand different discussion groups uh, by 1939. This was the idea of the book club, that you would find other people in your locality um, who were members of the, of, of the Left Book Club, and you would meet together um, on a, I don't know how often, Oliver, how often, monthly. So you would meet together and they would give you the beginning of discussion points to orientate your discussion. And then you would sit around discussing the book and its pros and merits and the issues that it, uh, that it raises um, uh, or not. Now, the key element here is that you, were, you weren't a passive consumer. It wasn't like going to the cinema and letting movers sort of watch over you. Instead, you had to be critically engaged. And this way, they hoped that they would create a more educated and informed citizen. And note the way that they bypass commercialization through retail outlets. Is there anything else I should have added here? And are there any particular social and political programs that, um, uh, that come out as a consistent um, part of these discussions and publications? Uh, well, Fantastic. Finally, um, I want to talk to you about um, the Peckham Health Centre. Um, and this is going to seem uh, like a stretch, but bear with me and I'll try and explain why it's a, a, a part of this attempt to recreate a socially responsible type of leisure and an educated um, uh, citizen. Um, uh, the Peckham Health Centre had been set up in the, um, uh, earlier in the 1930s, um, I think in 1932, um, but it, it, it got this fabulous modern, modernist building um, uh, in uh, 1935, designed by the leading, one of the leading modernist architects in Britain at the time, uh, Sir Owen Williams. Um, the, the, the founders and instigators of this project were both medics, a um, man called George Williamson and a woman called Innes Piers. Um, and uh, what their interest was, was basically to develop a new model of preventive health. They had been very uh, worried by the medical effects of poverty and unemployment in the 1920s and the 1930s, and very concerned that working people were not getting the medical health, the medical help that they needed. And when they did, doctors <laughs> were stuck with dealing with the symptoms, okay? not trying to um, uh, cultivate uh, good health, but just dealing with the symptoms of bad health. So their idea was basically to create a new type of environment which would actively engage um, uh, the life of uh, their, their members. And again, a very important element of this was the creation of a new community. Okay, so they chose the site of Peckham in South East London because Peckham was a socially mixed environment where working class people and middle class people um, uh, lived in uh, close uh, proximity.